How are antioxidant medicines like Maxidol used in psychotherapy? Mexidol has many qualities that make it a very useful drug in neurology, treatment of substance abuse, and psychiatry. First of all, it is an antioxidant. That is, it protects brain cells from overoxidation and improves respiratory function. It is also used in the recovery period following certain illnesses. Secondly, it possesses a nootropic effect. This means it improves the regenerative effects of brain cells. Thirdly, it improves cognitive processes like attention, endurance, the nervous system, memory, memorization, and thought. So basically, in cases of certain neurological disorders, it provides a combination of effects. Moreover, it produces an anticonvulsant effect and helps the body expel toxic and poisonous substances. It can also help regulate vascular tone and function of the vegetative nervous system, where there are disorders such as vegetovascular dystonia. It is also an anti-anxiety medication. It has been shown to reduce anxiety, fear, and regulate sleep. It can help with nervous system disorders, including atherosclerosis and post-traumatic brain injury, encephalopathies, and in treatment of withdrawal symptoms. And for us, one of the most important things it does is increase production of endorphins. Endorphins are neurochemicals which produce happiness and positive moods. Their production is hindered by drug addiction and toxicity because the drug addict abuses substances that produce euphoria and altered states of consciousness. This is a pathological state of happiness that can deregulate and worsen production of dopamine and endorphins. Mexidol can help normalize these processes. This medication can be injected or taken in tablet form. Which method is preferred? Well, when it comes to injections, we understand that they can either be intramuscular or intravenous. They provide a stronger and quicker effect. Therefore, in particular, acute cases of withdrawal or intoxication, that is, extreme blows to the nervous system, the drug is administered in a dropper with a saline solution. The drug is dissolved in the solution and administered in drops. They can be administered once or twice a day depending on the indications. It comes as part of a complex treatment with detox therapy and rehab. After this, the patient may take intramuscular injections. We do this in cases where things like encephalopathy, memory problems, and impaired thinking are present. The intramuscular form of the drug is administered once a day. In longer courses of rehab treatment, the patient may also be given the drug as a tablet. As a rule, the tablets are administered twice a day. When we are converting doses to tablet form after intravenous or intramuscular injections, we have to monitor the dose so it doesn't change. The patient usually takes a dose twice a day of one to two pills, so the total amount doesn't exceed six. This is the maximum dose. Actually, eight tablets a day is the absolute limit. An important note, if we are starting a course of the drug in tablet form, in the event of unspecified withdrawal symptoms or clinical manifestations, we need to start with a course of one pill per day. Then, we can gradually increase the dose to two tablets. And then, later on, we can increase the dose to three tablets a day, up to four, but always two times a day. We can also decrease the dose, but it must be done gradually to one tablet a day. We reduce the dose gradually so that if the patient takes pills three times a day, it will go down to two. If it's twice a day, then it will still be two times a day, only with a smaller dose. After this, we switch to a regime of once a day, ideally in the evening so the patient can relax and sleep comfortably. Should the drug be taken before or after eating? These drugs should be taken after eating. We know that as a rule, medications taken while eating are usually enzymes to aid in digestion. Digestion. So no, these drugs are not to be taken while eating. Most often they're taken after, though they may be taken before. What is the length of the treatment course? Withdrawal symptoms usually last 7, 10, 12 or 15 days depending on the toxic substance the patient has ingested and the presentation of the symptoms. So usually 7 to 10 days. Among the side effects of Mexidol, headaches, nausea, insomnia and lowered oxygen levels have been reported. What should be done in these cases? Naturally, in these cases, we should monitor the dose. The course of treatment should start at a small dose. We start at a small dose, taking into account the patient's unique threshold of tolerance. We then raise the dose until we find that threshold, of course taking into account the patient's tolerance and clinical data. If the patient experiences side effects, then sometimes we need to take them off the medicine. The thing is, when we consider the possible consequences, they aren't observed in every patient. When bringing any medication into practice, they go through in vitro trials, that is, on glass, and then in in vivo, living organisms. Animal rights activists are against this, of course, but we do this to alleviate human suffering. That's why implementing a new medicine can take years, sometimes decades. After this, it's tested on volunteers. I myself took part in trials like this. Every volunteer patient has a record. 
and we observe the drug's effects on them. It includes observation of the skin, respiratory system, urine, etc., before, during, and after taking the drug. After these analyses have been completed, they are sent to a clinic and a laboratory. Then the pharmaceutical company responds to the results. They need to protect their reputation and ensure that complications don't negate the medicinal properties of the drug. So these complications are usually observed in a small number of patients and when not taken as prescribed by a physician. In what cases can children take Mexidol and from what age? Mexidol should not be taken by children. And what about pregnant women? Pregnant women also shouldn't take it. Are there any analogs to Mexidol? Yes, there are analogs. There's one called Melxiprim and Neurox. These medicines have their own brand names, but might differ from the original generic drug. I'll say it this way so it's clear to everyone. Sometimes we see a drug that has the same name as another, but we're sold an analog instead. We say, this is an analog, give me the original. We want the brand name drug, the original one. The difference between generic and original lies in the fact that the additional substances in the medicine might differ from one another, even if the active compound is the same. Some of these drugs aren't as well tested, and might even be dangerous. Sometimes they're produced in third world countries, or by local, private companies. Although the company name is usually somewhere in brackets, while the brand name is different. Pharmacists usually say the following. Large firms spend millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions, developing drugs. This includes a lot of laboratory work and then decades of testing. They try to event and remove side effects found during the testing. They do this to make the drug less harmful and toxic. However, these brands from the third world countries are released under a lease of the patent, or even sometimes illegally. It's the same active substance, but the additional components are different. Sometimes these additives can produce side effects. That's why, if you have the financial means, it's best to buy the original drug. If you wish to buy the generic form, it's significantly cheaper, but it's advised to stay away from untested substances.